loyalty tips for executives. Uh, this is part of the Full Monty series of interviews. My name is Dov Barron. I'm your host. And if you are a regular listener, thank you very much because through you, we have become number one in the Fortune 500 category, number one in human resources. And you are the ones who have kept us at the top of leadership and business because you're part of well over our 1 million downloads. If you are a new listener, thank you very much for joining us. And of course, uh, we want to say it's always up to you. We're always interested in your feedback and your input because you help us to stay relevant. So make sure you please go over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And please share the show with everybody you know. I want to thank you for joining us. Today, of course, is one of those special shows where I have a awesome guest, Dory Clark. Now, Dory Clark, let me just sort of tell you a little bit about Dory. Dory is a marketing strategy consultant. You know, marketing strategy consultant, professional speaker, frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Time, Entrepreneur, and the World Economic Forum blog. Recognized as a branding expert, <clears throat> excuse me, by the Associated Press, Fortune, Inc. Magazine, she's the author of a highly acclaimed book, Reinventing You, Defining Your Brand, Imagine Your Future, which has been translated into multiple languages. She's most recently, her most recent book, rather, is an acclaimed, highly acclaimed book called Stand Out, How to Find Your Breakthrough Idea and Build a Following Around It. You should get yourself a copy of that, get yourself over to Amazon and do so, or Barnes & Noble, or your bookstore, preferably. Uh, she consults and speaks with a diverse group of clients, including Google, the World Bank, Microsoft, Morgan Stanley, Ford Foundation, Bill and, Mi Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Yale University, and many other high-level organizations. Dory is one bright individual. At age of 14, she entered Mary Baldwin College program for the exceptionally gifted, not just gifted, but the exceptionally gifted. <laughs> At 18, she graduated Phi Beta Kappa, which, by the way, for those of us who grew up in the UK or Australia, we have no idea what that means, uh, from Smith College, and two years later received a Master's in Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School. Yes, we have that in common too, which is the background in all that weird and wonderful religious philosophy stuff. She went on to become a political reporter, presidential campaign spokesperson, nonprofit executive director, documentary filmmaker. Now, as many of you know, I was named as one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers to uh, hire for your next conference. Well, let me tell you, I am in some extraordinary company because in that company is Dory Clark, who was also named to that list with me, Dory, some other people you might have heard of, like Richard, somebody or other, begins with a B. Oh, Branson, that the guy. So, you know, we're in very good company here. Dory, welcome. It's so great to have you with us. We're so happy to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you very much for doing so. Thank you, Dov. I'm glad to be talking with you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So, your new book, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about branding yourself. I want to talk about having, making yourself stand out. I think that the the world of social media has been a great blessing and a great curse for a lot of people, for, particularly for people like me who do everything, lots of things, are always busy, and lots of leaders I think are extraordinarily busy, and, and we know we got to get out there. Now, I know that some people have their own people, their own, and they go out and do it for them, but those of us who are dedicated to being authentic and want to get our voice out there... Let's start off by asking you what I think is probably the most pertinent question for everybody, which is how do you break through the noise? How, how would you recommend that, that we, as leaders, break through the noise and stand out? Well, fundamentally, Dov, there's, there's two pieces to becoming a recognized expert. Uh, in the course of researching Stand Out, I, I talked to about 50 different top thought leaders from a variety of different fields, um, everything from, uh, from technology and, uh, and business to genomics and real estate, trying to understand the common denominator. And so the, the two pieces that you have to get right, first of all, are making sure, number one, that, uh, that you have a substantive idea that you are known 
known for. You have to have you know real meat behind it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there has to be uh, something that uh, that that stands out. You know, with substance. The second part, however, which where a lot of people fall short is they assume that having a good idea is enough, mm-hmm. and it really isn't. You have to roll up your sleeves and be willing to share that idea, to market it, to to get known and build a following. So if we were talking about how to uh, to go ahead and, and get known for that idea, I would say really briefly, in terms of building a following, it's a three-step process. Number one, you have to build your network, the small group of people around you. Mm-hmm. Number two, you then need to start sharing it and building your audience, so publicly making it known. And third is where you begin to build your community around your idea. If you can do those three things, you can really begin to gain traction and get known. All right. But you and I, I'm sure this happened to you because I know it happens to me and I, I'm not in the same game as you are. So you and I invariably be, bump into people who have a brilliant idea. At least that's the framework within sight between their ears. Um, it's a brilliant idea, but it's not. I think if you spent an hour or two sitting with that person, it is a brilliant idea, but they can't really give me the short form. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and if I have a two hour conversation with them, I really get to it. Oh, this is brilliant. But how do you, how would you recommend, how would you help somebody who says, okay, this is, the, you know, it's this massive umbrella. I'm trying to refine it. And I'm not a, the problem with refining is I don't want to make it sound so simple that it sounds like generic, like everybody else's. What would you recommend? Yeah, that is a challenge that a lot of people face because, um, you know, most of us are, are not necessarily trained in how do you distill the ideas down. There's a famous saying attributed to, to Mark Twain that says, if you need me to give you a, a four-hour speech, I can do it right now. Uh, if you need me to give you a 15-minute speech, uh, give me a month or two and I'll work <laughs> on it. And I think that's really true. Well, you uh, know you've done TEDx, so you know that's definitely true. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly longer to work those ones out oh man they give you 12 minutes it is uh, it is painful to whittle it down exactly but so if someone is facing that uh you know that that sort of general scenario where they you know they have a big idea but they don't really know how to articulate it well uh a couple of thoughts the first one this actually really is where the first piece about building your network comes in you want to have a trusted cadre of people around you because they serve as your initial sounding board a problem that too many people face is they know i mean you know we we hear a lot these days about spreading our ideas and so as a result um people think oh the minute I have an idea I should put it out there and then you know the market the market will respond and then I can pivot if I need to and you know whatever you know this sort of you know MVP the minimum viable product ideology and I think that that is true to a certain extent I mean yes you want to make sure that you get your idea out there and get feedback from consumers quickly however that doesn't mean that it's an excuse to throw out just you know a crappy half finished idea it needs to be in as good a shape as you can get it without putting all the frills and bells and whistles on it so the place where you can begin to get that kind of feedback is by having let's say half a dozen people in your life for you know who you really respect you respect their opinions and you go to them specifically and ask them is this making sense is this the best way to say it do you think that people would resonate with it and that initial uh, kind of back and forth is going to be enormously important to you in terms of developing the skills to be able to get down your your talking points you know it's like it's like being a politician you you had mentioned in my bio that I used to work as a presidential campaign spokesperson and one of the things we always say is you need need to be able to do the 30 second sound bite if they want more information they will ask you more questions sure. but you need to be able to say it succinctly and practicing extensively with your trusted colleagues first is a good step but when you talk about you know uh, putting your idea forward talking to these these individuals uh, the challenge i see with that is uh people have a chronic case of canadian uh, meaning that they're nice. And so, they, oh, yeah, that's great. That's Oh, yeah, that's really great. <laughs> and invariably, I, I don't know that you... I don't know that you could with that kind of stuff, particularly with 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 a with a quote, big idea or something what it is, I don't know that you can trust the people who love you. 
because they love you. They're going to think everything you do is fantastic. Oh, you're amazing. You're wonderful. How do you, how would you suggest that people get, get to people like who, who are more neutral, more, uh, clear thinking and less biased towards pleasing you? Cause like I work as a mentor and one of the things I say as a mentor, my job is not, is not to pat you on the back or blow smoke up your rear end. My, my job is to, to give you the clearest possible guidance I can give. A and invariably people will come and say, but my best friend and my wife and my mother and, and my aunt Sally and, and the guy in the corner store, I'll think this is fantastic. Yeah, it's absolutely. So I think it really goes to the question of choosing well. Uh, if if you're going to ask your mother, I mean, you're you're sort of setting yourself up at this point for you know somebody who will be really nice to you and think everything that you do is special, and that's gr it's a great thing to have in your corner in certain circumstances. Yeah, but when, when you it feel comes like to crap and you need somebody to, to make you feel better, that's good. Exactly. It's not but when it comes. When it comes to testing a new business idea, that is not the formula for success. No. So, you know, fundamentally, it's it's thinking through. I mean, the the way that I, I like to think of this, you actually want to be really systematic and say to yourself, all right, what are the areas that are either the growth areas that I need to learn more about? I mean, for me, let's, let's imagine I could say, all right, I want to develop more online courses. So I want to make sure I have people around me who know about that, who understand that. Um, maybe it's, uh, it's things that are important to my business in general. So mm -hmm. it could be that, you know, if something that's really important to my business is a mobile strategy, I want to have somebody in my life who's knowledgeable about that, where if I ask them a question, I feel pretty solid that, that they're going to have a good perspective and I can learn from them. So, you know, coming up with these sort of core lists of things that you really want to learn and that you have people where you you don't doubt their wisdom. Mm -hmm. they, they know their stuff and it's proactively going to them. I think the mistake that a lot of people make is they just take the people who are already there around them, you know, yeah. your your drinking buddies or something, you say, oh, hey, what do you think of this? But it, it has to be a much more strategic thing. It's thinking in advance about what do I need in my life and then going out and getting that, you know, getting those people in your life and, uh, and surrounding yourself with them and making sure that those are the opinions you're listening to, not just, uh, you know, the, the sort of happenstance ones that come your way. There's a, there's a, a big movement idea that's been around for 10, maybe even as long as 20 years, which is surround yourself with like-minded people. And I get it. Don't get me wrong. I get it. I understand it. It's expansive. Um, but I also think it's extremely important to surround yourself with people who are not like-minded, mm -hmm. who, who think differently than you, who can see the blind spots you can't see, who are not going to pat you on the back. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think I think absolutely that that's useful. I mean, one of the the really interesting things um, I used to blog pretty frequently for for Forbes, and uh, one of the folks that I interviewed for that um, this actually made it into a, a new ebook that I wrote recently called Standout Networking as well uh, was a woman named Diana McLean Smith, who's an organizational psychologist who wrote a book called The Elephant in the Room Ooh. about all the conflicts that people have at work. And one of the points that she raised that I thought was very interesting was the fact that you know all the studies, I mean, they're fairly unanimous that uh, if you want better ideas, better creativity, better overall workplace performance, what you need to do is surround yourself with opposites, you know, people who really do think differently than you because they're the ones that challenge you, that help you grow. The problem and the reason we don't do this is that even though it's good for us, it's like eating your vegetables. We kind of hate to be around people <laughs> like that. And so we just, we kind of don't want to make ourselves do it. Yeah. And so that is, uh, the, the, the real paradox is that um, we we need to seek that out, but we may not want to seek that out. So uh, so giving ourselves a little nudge in that direction well, and reminding ourselves is important. I think that we, we, we give ourselves the, the comfort of saying, well, they're just being negative. As opposed to, my idea is not flushed out. As opposed to, uh, well, I'm really on the wrong track. We just go, they're negative. And I think that that's part of the challenge that uh, that leaders particularly face is that we, it's very, you know, one of the things I've, I've said many times to leaders is how do you know you're a good leader? You know, and, and it's a, it's a baffling question as simple as it sounds. It's a baffling question because most leaders are surrounded by sycophants, 
right? I mean, yeah, you know, you've absolutely. You yourself by sycophants. I mean, the, the whole thing of um, whether you thought Lincoln was a great prime minister, whether you think Obama is a great prime minister or not, those two prime, uh, prime minister, I don't know why I said prime minister, president, okay, I had a flashback to being a child and living in the UK. Uh, <laughs> I sort of like the idea, though Lincoln, sure. the prime minister. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of charming. Think, maybe, but <laughs> but when, when you um, if you look at them, they both made sure that they had people around them who did not agree with them, who, who you know who were not sycophantic, and uh, that that I think that I want that. I want people around me who are going to cheer me on. I want people who are going to hold me up. I want people who are going to pat me on. I do want that. But I also need, because it's want and the need, and what I need is also people who will help me to say, does this work? And ha what's the, how do you know this will work? And I think it's a really important piece for all of us. Um, when it comes to bringing, quote, your big idea to the world, do you think that we've got to be looking for because I think this is a battle that people have. You think we've got to be looking for something that is brand new? You know, because I think that people are looking to be, particularly in the last 20 years, looking to be the next Steve Jobs. You know, I want to be the next creator of the next something that is the iPod or the, you know, the, the you know, what that was in, the, in its day. Do you think that we need to do that or do you think there's something else? Yeah, I think it's a really important question, and I actually do believe that uh, that originality is uh, is overrated, and in mm -hmm. fact, is kind of a crutch that a lot of people use to, so that they can excuse themselves from never trying mm -hmm. because they think, well, I I can't be Steve Jobs, so you know clearly this information is not for me. Right. Uh, but the the truth is, you don't you don't need to be Steve Jobs, you don't need to be Albert Einstein, you don't need to you know create some you know new theory of everything that that uh, you know shows how how the world is. Um, Really what we are talking about when it comes to a breakthrough idea is just something that moves the ball forward in a distinctive way. I think that really is uh, is all we need to focus on. There's actually uh, every two years there is a, a ranking. This is kind of interesting. They rank a lot of things these days. And one of them is there's a listing of the world's top management thinkers uh, called Thinkers 50. And I interviewed a guy named Stuart Craner, who's one of the, the co-founders of this. And he, he told me that that actually – when it comes to the the world's leading business thinkers today, a lot of them, a fair number of them, are what he calls synthesizers. They're not necessarily the people who are even coming up with the ideas themselves. They're people who maybe like Malcolm Gladwell are condensing the work of other people and bringing light to things that hadn't been talked about enough. Uh, you know, we think, oh, the 10,000 hours, you know, makes you an expert. Uh, you know, that, that sort of a meme that has come out of mm. Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, that, you know, that study, that's a study that had been out there for years. Uh, it's yeah. by a Florida State researcher named Anders Ericsson, uh, but Malcolm Gladwell popularized it, and now everybody says, oh, you know, Gladwell's 10,000 hours. You don't have to come up with this stuff. You, if you can popularize it, if you can find ways to uh, to talk about things that that should be talked about but people have not been that's enough you know one of my very favorite examples is Howard Schultz who created a multi billion dollar empire not by inventing coffee not by inventing coffee shops but simply by making a coffee shop that felt different yeah and if you can do that that is a breakthrough idea yeah I uh, you know I one of my business heroes is Richard Branson. And I'm sure you probably know the story around Virgin, but you know, people don't actually think about that word. But when you think about that word, it was Branson's philosophy was that I don't want to know. Don't tell me the bias of the industry. I want to go in not knowing so that I don't have that bias. I want to be a virgin. I want to go in with virgin, a virgin thinking about something. Um, I love what you said. You said uh, innovation rarely comes from the center. Um, and I think that that's an important piece for th people to remember. We look at those experts and we go, oh, I don't know as much as them. But you, each of us, have a fresh set of eyes. You know, your background is theology, right? Uh, you're not talking about theology. Theology and branding, yeah, no sound same. 
<laughs> They're very different things. Uh, my background is in psychology and religious philosophy, metaphysics and quantum physics. You know, we're both brainiacs, you know, but I'm doing leadership as it pertains to the psychology side of it. There are things that you gained in, I believe, I would say that you gained as a framework, even in your study of theology that helped you with politics, that's helped you with being a reporter, that's helped you with all the things doing, including brand, that, that I, you know, I say that learning is not wasted and that each one of those things has given you a different lens so that you're looking at branding from a place that somebody with no, who doesn't have that background would never see. And I think that's an important message for each of our listeners, each of our viewers to get is that whatever your background is, that has given you a unique insight. So stop copying, stop trying to be somebody else, stop trying to be Jobs or stop trying to be Dory Clark, stop trying to be Dove Baron, but instead bring what it is that's unique and authentic about you with this wonderful, beautiful naivety about what it is. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, th I think that's right on. I mean, very much so in uh, in Standout, I talk about the fact that the the ideas that we put forward, sometimes, uh, you know, people think, oh, it's got to be this, you know, this big lightning strike. That that's, that's where ideas come from. It's just one day you wake up and you have this amazing idea. And until that time, well, you know, guess what? You, you just don't have ideas. And it's, it's absolutely the opposite of that. Um, what I discovered in the course of talking to all these experts is that fundamentally – what is a far more common scenario is that you start working in a field or you start working on a problem because you are curious about it, because you are interested in it. You have absolutely no idea how to solve that problem no. or how to, you know, you know, even necessarily what direction you want to go. But you just start mucking around with it and doing stuff. And it's in the course of doing it that you are able to – that, that, that – ideas present themselves to you. It is an iterative process, and that comes from your own personal experiences. You would not even have access to be able to see those things, to make those connections, if you weren't drawing on what was unique about you. Uh, so to the extent that anyone feels like, oh, if I just copy this, you know, the so-and-so playbook exactly, that's what, what will get me there. No. I mean, there's there's precepts that you can follow. Sure. Uh, there's sort of general uh, ideas. You know, I talk in Standout about following a niche strategy where you get really known for, for a narrow band of expertise and then you expand out from there. Or I talk about the importance of combining disciplines so that you can bring together, you know, maybe uh, whatever you have professional training in and whatever your hobbies are to create new hybrids that can create interesting solutions. Those are all frameworks that are useful, but uh, no one is going to succeed by, you know, trying to be Richard Branson, they're going to succeed by being themselves. Absolutely. Um, for me, it's a huge part of my work and, and, and certainly my philosophy is that everything is relationship. Every, uh, my, I have a relationship with the air. It fills my lungs. I have a relationship with food in the way it tastes and what it does to my body. And, and every interaction is, is a relationship um, that we either destroy, we keep neutral, or we grow. I loved what you were saying about lucky people. Tell, tell us about lucky people, because that to me was so on point about relationships. Yeah, thank you, Dov. Well, one of the things that I thought was, was really interesting um, as, as I was going through the, the research process was I um, spoke to a guy named Anthony Chan, who is the co-author of a book called Heart Smarts, Guts, and Luck, which is a survey, kind of a wide-scale survey of successful entrepreneurs and executives, trying to understand what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the first, and so they wrote the book to talk about their findings. The first three categories are things that probably you and I could guess would make someone successful. They're heart-driven, so they're passionate. They're smarts-driven, so they're really intelligent. They're guts-driven, so they're really persistent. All of those things obviously would be useful tools in an entrepreneur's arsenal. But the part that seemed the most incongruous and that I was pretty fascinated by was what he called luck-driven entrepreneurs. And it turned out that with their testing, about 25%, a full quarter of the entrepreneurs identified as luck dominant. And so you peel that back a little bit because, you know, it sort of sounds like, all right, well, is it just that they don't have 
an, another explanation. Just like, oh, well, I guess they got lucky. But I think um, that's, the, that's the piece. I think, because people go, they say, oh, he got lucky. She got lucky. But mm-hmm. like, you know what you just said there? It's important. you got to peel that back because what is luck? And this is what I, this is what I loved about you said. Keep going. It's fabulous stuff. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of people just stop there and say, oh, it's luck, that's it. I don't have any. And that's an excuse uh, to not explore further, yeah. Um, But it turned out that that all of these luck-dominant entrepreneurs had uh, very clear characteristics in common with one another. And specifically, it was that they had an overabundance of two very important qualities. One was curiosity, and the other was humility. And what this what this did for them essentially is they were curious enough to want to talk to anybody. They were curious enough to want to uh, just see how things played out, to do things for the sake of of saying, "Oh, this seems interesting. Let's you know, let's let's explore this." And as a result, they were more open to experiences, and they were humble enough to understand that they had something to learn from every person and every experience. Whereas a lot of other people, even if they literally were in the same room with you know the the, the lucky folks, the other folks would just breeze past them because they they have an agenda. And if that person doesn't look like exactly the one the person that they want to meet, they're gonna blitz right by. But the lucky person is willing to you know, uncover things, to have a, a few words with them, to turn over the stones. And it's in that process that they see what no one else sees. I, I, did, a, I did a video called The Secret to Happiness Is. And I went through the three main factors that in my research of what has made people happy, what makes people happy. And of course, it's never what we think it is. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's not going out and pursuing and holding on to stuff. But one of the elements that was so clear to me was observing children, that children are incessantly curious. And, and it is that curiosity that brings us joy. Yeah, it sometimes can bring us pain. You put your hand on something and it was too hot, that, that's curiosity too. But it's, it's the learning process. Curiosity is, is, the, is the seed of all relationship. The willingness to come up and go, hey, you look interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, totally. Or, you know, or, or to walking in a room and going, that's a person I would never talk to. I should go talk to them. Yep. Like, I wonder what's there. But I think that uh, particularly as we get more, quote, successful in the eyes of the world, more, quote, powerful in the eyes of the world, I think it's far easier to go to, as you said, the agenda to walk into the networking, to walk into the event, whatever it is, with the agenda. I need to meet, uh, you know, I'm here to meet Dory Clark, you know, and there's a, you're in a room with a thousand people, and of them, there's probably at least a couple hundred who just rock your world, but right. you're looking for 30 seconds with Dory Clark to throw your idea at her so that she can say to you, you need to go away and think about her a bit more. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> that's right. So I think that that's... You know, I, I just loved what you were saying about that because luck is actually the willingness to have relationships, uh, you know, at the simplest level, but to, to inquire, to be curious. And I think it's a really, really important piece. I want to, I want to, we're coming close to our end and I want to get a sense from you. Can you give us a couple of real nuggets of how, so there are those of us in the world who are already out there, you know, we're already established, quote, but, we, you know, we're all looking to evolve that. We're all looking to become as famous and well-known and well-respected as Dory Clark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what would be a couple of your sort of golden tips for, not for beginners, but for people who are established for, for becoming the cream of the crop rather than the cream of the crap, which is the average. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, one that immediately stands out, Dov, that I thought was was personally really interesting, and I have tried uh, 
you know, since doing this interview to incorporate this into my own life. Um, when I was researching the book, I interviewed Robert Scoble, who some of your uh, listeners may be familiar with. He's a, a well-known opinion leader in the technology space. And he told me an interesting story. Uh, he's somebody who gets just hundreds and hundreds of emails a day um, because he's known as kind of a, you know, startup guru. So a mm-hmm. lot of startups uh, write to him and they want him to, uh, you know, to come talk to them, to, you know, uh, uh, blog about them, you know, all this stuff. They, you know, they sure. keep wanting stuff from him. And so just more volume than he can possibly deal with. But so when somebody writes to him with a question, what he says that he does is that he writes back and he says, I'm happy to answer your question, but not on email. And what he asks them to do instead is he he tells them to go to the website Quora, Q-U-O-R-A, the question and answer website. Mm-hmm. And he says to put it there and he will he will answer it online. And he says, the reason he does it is that if I email one person, then I've helped one person. Yeah. But if I can answer the question online, I'm able to help five people or 50 people or 500 people. And I think, you know, all of us are too busy. All of us are just back to back with meetings and tweets and emails and responsibilities that we have to do. We're not going to get more time. We have to find ways to increase the leverage in our own lives and to ask ourselves, how can I do this one thing and help more people? people with it or reach more people with it. And so um, Robert's strategy, I think, was was quite powerful in that regard. And, you know, there's other examples. I spoke with a guy named Mark Fidelman, who, uh, like me, uh, is a, or, you know, like I used to be, was is a Forbes blogger. Mm-hmm. And I was always really impressed with Mark's strategy uh, for the blog post that he did, and I asked him about it, and I was I was really astonished. Um, he for each blog that he does, he says it takes him nearly a hundred hours, which is insane. But the reason is that he he does one group, he does one piece of work essentially, which he turns into the blog post, but then he literally finds 10 different ways to leverage it so that he's actually saving time in the end because he'll write a blog post and he will turn it into a huge series of tweets based on pull quotes from the blog. He will create uh, placards on Instagram, you know, with those quotes and send that out. You can make a video, you know, short video where you talk about the highlights of what you learned from from doing that blog post. He ha- he will hire at a very uh, low price a graphic designer in Eastern Europe to create a slide share based on his blog post. Um, he, you know, just keeps going. He also combines the research project with his networking efforts. So he takes all the people that he wants to network with anyway, and he interviews them as kind of a, you know, an excuse or an entry point to speak with them. So he's combining the networking value with the research value. He also, in addition to to the blog post that he creates, he will get a special tip from them, you know, like your bonus tip. Right. Then he creates it with the help of the graphic designer. He turns it into an ebook that people can download. And so he uses that ebook as a lead gen tool because people have to enter their email address to get it. And because these people are included in it, they'll help him promote it. So he has all of these powerful people helping him to build his email list. So it's it's just being incredibly strategic about taking the work that you do once and thinking about 10 different ways that you can spread it and make it count. Wow. So repurposing, I mean, really taking a blog post and turning it into a business. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Wow. It's got to be integrated with everything. That's very, very powerful. Very powerful. Tell us, tell us, do you have, uh, you must have, I'm sure you do, a story of um, a funny story of somebody coming to you for brand advice. Uh, um, I can imagine there are any number of people who come to you for brand advice um, that personify uh, what it is you're talking about or personify uh, what it is you're recommending against. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's it's uh, it's a great question, and I do I do get some random ones. Um, oh, sure. You know, I mean, sometimes they're just they're random in a very sweet way. Yeah. Um, you know, I have. Uh, so when people sign up for my email list, I have, uh, you know, an autoresponder message that goes out and I, and I invite people. I say, you know, if you have other questions, please, please email me. Please let me know what's on your mind. And so, 
you know, usually I'll get questions that are sort of in line with the things that I typically write about. But one one uh, reader uh, saw that and decided, you know, hey, I'm going to I'm going to see how Dory can help me. And so uh, he wrote back and he said that he wanted to know if I could if I could blog more in the future about agricultural techniques in Africa. <laughs> and Okay. So I'm uh, yeah I'm taking that under advisement. I haven't done it yet, but uh, but yeah. So so that was kind of a random one. Another one which actually is sort of in line with uh, you know with things that I write about. You know, because I, I do a lot of stuff, you know, around marketing and branding and personal brand. Uh, but so one woman called me up and I was I was supposed to do a phone interview, um, you know, right at that time. I, you know, I don't always, uh, you know, in fact, mostly I don't answer my phone if it's not a number that I recognize, mm -hmm. because a lot of times it's, you know, somebody I that I don't really want to talk to. Uh, but I was expecting a call uh, from somebody from the New York area. And so sure enough, you know, I get a call from the New York area. I think it's this woman for the interview. And it turns out it's uh, it's not. Uh, it was a woman who, you know, the first thing she said is, I didn't think you'd really pick up. And I'm like, oh, goodness. And she... I wouldn't and, have. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And she starts, uh, she starts, immediately starts launching into telling me her story and I swear to you, within 30 seconds, it was actually terrible. She was crying, and she wanted she wanted to know if I could help her uh, with her online branding because apparently her online brand, she said, had been sullied because her um, her husband had gotten involved with some woman and it had broken up their marriage and that woman somehow had ties to the mafia and I'm just like oh my god <laughs> this is this is probably more than uh, the, more than I want to bite off here I actually don't do uh, online reputation management I mean I, I advise about it but I, I don't really like do the cleanup particularly when the mob is involved well, I was gonna say, um, you know I think that there's a there may be a whole niche for you there Dory the, door, <laughs> the, the, the niche may be rebranding the mob <laughs> yeah they could Come probably use it they got yeah. the money you right, know, right. You're, you're in the location geographically <laughs> you know this could be a whole other new world for you it's true it's always good to diversify our revenue streams Just think about think about the book title rebranding the mob right there who would not read that book who would not read that book if i can rebrand the, the mob i can rebrand anybody Come see Dory Clark. <laughs> so true. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great having you on the show. You've gave really great insights and, and ways for us to look at getting out there, standing out, making a difference about what it is we do. Please tell our viewers, our listeners, where they can find out more about you. Where's the best places to go? Dov, thank you. Uh, the best place to uh, to stay in touch and to find out more is my website. It's doryclark.com, D-O-R-I-E-C-L-A-R-K. And in fact, for folks that are interested in developing their own breakthrough idea, I uh, have created a free 42-page workbook that is adapted from my book, Stand Out. And uh, folks can download that for free at doryclark.com. And I'm also on Twitter, at Dory Clark. Awesome. Thank you again for, for being here. We're going to make sure that we post all the links to your to your sites and we'll make sure we have your Twitter link on there as well. Uh, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thank you so much. And if you would stay with us at the, for a minute after we come off air, I want to thank you personally. But for all of you who've joined us today, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing the show with everyone you know. Remember to get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. It's been great having you here. Until next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious.